Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Charles Green and I'm part of the marketing team here at Bellatrix Software and I'm going to be your host today. For those of you not familiar with Bellatrix, we are a leading provider of software development services. And we have offices in New York and Silicon Valley, as well as through, throughout several countries in Latin America. We work with clients ranging from cutting edge startups to established Fortune 500 companies. And we work with these organizations in turning their ideas into powerful and engaging software products. And to turn these ideas into powerful software products, many organizations are looking to DevOps to increase the speed and the quality of software development and delivery. Indeed, implementing DevOps has quickly become one of the top priorities for both technology and business executives. So to understand more about DevOps and in particular why Azure DevOps services represents a powerful option for enterprises today, I'm delighted to be joined by Ernesto Carenas. Ernesto, welcome to today's webinar. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi. Hi. Yes. Uh, as Charles mentioned, my name is Ernesto Cárdenas. I've been working in Bellatrix by, by around, by around three years as a, as a developer engineer. I focus mostly on what the DevOps approach is, and especially in, with Microsoft technologies. In fact, I, currently I'm Microsoft MVP for developer technologies. Um, according to that, I'm going to share a few things about DevOps and Azure DevOps. So let's start. Super, thanks, Anessa. Um, just very quickly, so uh, before we get into the presentation, just let everyone on the line know today. If you want to ask a question, please do so. You can do so either by typing into the, the chat box on your screen or via Twitter. We'll be using the hashtag um, DevOpsBSF and we'll also be live tweeting throughout the presentation as well. But with it, without any further ado, over to you, Anessa. Yes. Uh, before going deep into what Azure DevOps is, we need, we need to try to get an idea what DevOps is. So there are a lot of definitions, and the currently used by Microsoft is DevOps, the union of people, process, and products to enable continued delivery of value to your end users. So look at the sequence of the words. People came first. So what I understand for this is there are people that are trying to provide value to the users, people that decide what kind of process are going to be used to enable that goal. And then based on the process, we can choose the products, the tools, the technology that will be used in the end to deliver such a goal. Okay, so, and what continuous delivery is? It's a continuous cycle that starts when the company, the product owner, uh, decides, okay, we need to deliver this new product, this new functionality, and start with planning to set our goals for the product. And then the, there is a team that develops the, the, the software. And then such, uh, and delivered by creating code. So such code, later is built automatically and being tested. You can perform unit tests for ensure the quality of code or test over the user interface or manual test. And after you complete such steps, the increment of, of software, it's deployed. It's deployed to different environments, a QA, a staging or production. And obviously the key part is to have the software in production. But what we can do after our software is on uh, production, have been deployed, we need to operate it. We need to make sure that it's running on the proper servers, that the database are working okay. Yes, I monitor what's happening. But with monitor, monitor there is something that sometimes we forget. We forget that we need to understand how our software is being used. So, to and also to notice if such functionality is slow, it has fails, and sometimes we can put a lot of effort in trying to get to deliver a new functionality, but 
in the end it will be such such functionality is not being used or being used in a different way that we expected. So in that situation, what we can do? We can learn. We can learn our what happened and try to use such new knowledge and plug it again and start a new experiment and modify and make the software better. So after that, the cycle continues and starts again. So that's the idea of how continuous delivery provides value or to our end users. So we are we've been talking about the Bob since 2013 and five years have passed and we now we now have metrics. We know currently that by using the DevOps approach, the companies are able to deliver software faster, and by doing that, they are faster to answer the market requirements, and now the, the companies have more, they have found that now it's more easy to deliver changes. The increase has renewed, and yes, they could be failures, but you know, the failures have been reduced, and if you have failures or your system fails, the time to recover has reduced. So by implementing a proper DevOps approach, you can achieve such amazing results, okay? That's numbers that we've learned in the past five years. So in order to do that, we need to try to figure out what kind of technologies do we need to achieve such results. We need continuous integration. Continuous integration, it's a mindset, it's a practice that makes us to de deliver new increments of code frequently. So every member of the team is committed to add value to the source repository and such increments must be built and tested frequently in order to know if everything is working well together and it works properly. But that's only the first part, continuous integration is only a part because what we can do if we only have the code being tested? How do we know that if the code works properly. In order to get that, we need continuous deployment. It's a practice that we need to be able to put such changes frequently over the target environments and validate, obviously, that they're working fine. And we need another set of practice, continuous learning and monitoring. We need to learn over what's happening in our target environments and with that understand if our recent deployment was good or not. So a tool or set of tools that are supposed to help us with DevOps are required to do these techniques properly. Okay. So Microsoft had a tool called Visual Studio Team Service that cuts roots from Team Foundation Server, uh, a product that was delivered by first time around 2005. And Visual Studio Team Service, it was planned as an integrated suite of tools that provide all the support that we mentioned. Agile planning, continuous integration, continuous deployment, and so on. But what happened? The tools were aligned so couplet. So sometimes the customers say, okay, and the um, BSTS looks great, but I don't want everything. I'm using another repository, I don't want to use yours, I only want a part of this. So starting this year, Microsoft 
introduce a, kind, a set of changes over BSTS. First, they started with a process called verticalization. And but by doing that, every set of functionalities will be able to work at its own, not necessarily working together with the rest, but if you do that, you, you can get an integrated uh, toolbox of services. And that's something that we are coming, we'll see in the demo. And also, the, the set of tools was changed to with the goal to work with any platform, any language, and any cloud. So that's how Azure DevOps is, is positioned as a rebranding of BSTS, but with new set of goals, a new approach for the end users. Okay. So Azure DevOps, as I mentioned, is a set of services. First of all, we have Azure Boards. It's one of the oldest functionality of, of the product. It allows you to keep tracking of how the development process is going. If you, if you want, you can use Scrum or you can use CMMI. It's up to you and you have a, a powerful tool for tracking the advance in your software development process. We have Azure Pipelines. For most of us, Azure Pipelines is the star of the service offered by Azure DevOps. It allows you to build your application, test it, and it has a powerful set of extensions and tasks that allows you to deploy in a different combination of environment, okay? Of course, if you if we're going to work with software, we need where to store code, and for that, Azure repos its offer. It's a powerful JIT-based tool, and that also includes a very interesting support for branch planning, okay? And yes, if you have an application, we want to test it. So we can, with, but you, with Azure test plans, we can define a set of plans uh, and to know, okay, this set of, of test case has the different tests and so on. And we can keep a very, um, a very powerful set of dashboards to know how the health of our application has evolved. And finally, Azure Artifacts. It's kind of a new member of the of the family because it has evolved in the last years. Uh, Azure Artifacts allows, you, allows us to share easily code amongst big teams. I'm going to discuss this in a further slide. Okay, let's start with the star of the suite, Azure Pipelines. The goal of Azure Pipelines is that you can get your code uh, in different languages uh, because we, you can work with Node.js, Python, Java, PHP, Ruby, Go, and anything what you want. and being able to validate how healthy is your code, test it, put another steps, and finally be able to deploy it to any target. So you not you are not committed to deploy only to Azure. You can deploy it to Amazon. You can deploy it to Google. But you require that the tool is extensible. Why? Because out of the box, Azure DevOps provides a big set of tasks or a big set of things that you can do. But what happens if there is something that it's not provided out of the box? Well, you can create extensions. My friend Colin Dembowski has created a set of extensions in order to support tokenization. Another friend of mine has created an extension that allows you to provide a better integration of Azure DevOps with, uh, with GitLab, a third-party source code repo, it could be integrated 
to Azure DevOps by one extension created by a developer. So there is an interesting marketplace for extensions that add extra functionality to our pipelines. Also, Azure Pipelines provides support for Docker, so by doing that, you can get support for Linux containers, Windows containers, obviously, uh, support for Kubernetes, and yes, you can have support for Azure Container Instance, uh, Azure Registry, so it's very in, well integrated with what Docker technology is. Um, it has a great support for open source projects, as we can see in the next slide. Yes, Microsoft loves open source, something that we couldn't believe uh, a few years ago. And what does it mean in the case of Azure Pipelines? It does mean that if you have an open source project, you can, you'll have unlimited build minutes. That means that if your software requires to be built and test so frequently, you don't need to worry about the time. You just, you can only put your test over in, in a pipeline and run it and run it every time that you want because you, you are creating something that's about to be shared for the community. Plus, you, if your software is required to be built frequently, you, sometimes you, you want parallel works. And yes, you can have a lot of parallel works. 10 free parallel jobs across Windows, Linux, and Mac. Uh, did I mention that you are not committed to only work with Azure repos? Well, if you've been used GitHub, you have to know that since a few years ago, GitHub is very well integrated with Azure DevOps. That means that if you have your repos in GitHub, you don't need to change anything. You just need to plug your source code over Azure Pipelines. It will work fine. You will be able to integrate it with your pull requests, with your branches, and so on. Plus, recently, Microsoft added the option to integrate Azure Pipelines from the GitHub web directly. You don't, previously you have to go first to Azure Repos environment in order to connect your GitHub. Now it works in the other way. So more power for the GitHub developers. Also, you are not restricted to only work with uh, Azure Repos or GitHub. If you are been working with a uh, Bitbucket or a uh, GitLab, as I mentioned, you can use Azure Pipeline if you want. It works smoothly. I work with those tools and it works very fine. Okay, Azure Boards, as I mentioned, is one of the oldest tools provided uh, by originally by Team Foundation Server and later by Visual Studio Team Service and now Azure DevOps. And what's the idea with uh, Azure Boards is that you can have boards to keep tracking of how the software development process is going and you also have support for Kanban restrictions. So if you want to monitor that there is not a lot of tools being performed in parallel. You can set up Kanban limits over your boards. It works with the Scrum, the old Agile template, and also if you are still using CMMI, you can use it. And finally, you can have a very powerful set of statistics of your development process. I have to mention that if you have any questions, you can um, ask your question in Twitter by using the hashtag DevOpsBSF. Okay. And by the end of the session, I'll try to answer your questions. Okay. Azure Repos is the source code repository provided by Azure DevOps. Uh, alongside with the powerful JIT support, it continues to support Team Foundation version control 
for legacy projects and it will keep such such support it has all what you expected from a from a JIT provider it, it has support for webhooks uh, API integration with um, a diverse set of providers it has semantic code search over your code over your repos and also has a powerful set of branch policies so you can put restriction or rules over your branches in order to define a smoother process for your developer teams as i mentioned with azure test plans you define the set of tests that are going that are going to be uh, performed over your um, your software deployments and as you can see you have a, a very rich set of dashboards that allows you to know okay all the tests were performed which tests work fine which not and so on so allowing you to have uh, end to end traceability over the quality of your software okay i have to mention a few things about azure artifacts uh, it relates to a common problem for delivering code amongst organization look at this you have a medium or big company uh, that working in different parts of the application and you have shared code a code that is about to be shared in all the teams sometimes what you can do well in a previous project mm, the team in charge of the shared code put the DLLs, the libraries in a network place and we have to copy and cop uh, copy from it and put in our projects but what happened if such code changed it happened a lot of things one of the thing is that perhaps one team wasn't aware of the changes and still working with an old version and later uh, and a future version break compatibility and you weren't aware of it and it could be a very messy issue and the team we could be fighting because why why you you change this no but i changed it uh, three weeks ago why, why you didn't update so the idea with azure artifacts is to provide the teams with a way to deliver in a fit model the changes of shared code by using artifacts like nugget npm or maven so you can version your changes and you can notify the teams okay there is a new version of the uh, of the package and the team could decide to upgrade now or wait for the next version and if for any reason a team has to wait to update the software it won't be an issue because you can have all the version and keep tracking of which version are are you using or being used by your teams so in that way share code amongst them won't be an issue it will be easy for with using azure artifacts okay okay let's stop talking about uh, theory and move to the practice okay so this is the main screen for my Azure DevOps organization and I have to mention a word in the context of Azure DevOps when you request an instance of Azure DevOps what you are doing is creating an Azure DevOps organization so in my organization I have a few team projects and what I'm going to do is okay I'm going to go into this team project that I created for this webinar Mm -hmm. uh, I have a wiki I can see my dashboards but look at this I have 
uh, here Azure repos and Azure pipelines. But you can say, hey, Ernesto, you mentioned about artifacts, plans, and boards. Okay, yeah, that's right. But the, but I decide that for this team project, I only require to work with Azure repos and Azure pipelines. So let's see this. This is the project settings. As you can see, I took off all the service, but repos and pipelines. Artifacts was turned off. The boards were turned off. And there is something very important to know about it. Test plans uh, has a dependency on boards. That means if you switch off Azure boards, you won't be able to switch on test plan. That's how it works, okay? So, first of all, let's see the files. This is a very simple um, .NET Core application based on this book, Entity Framework Core in Action. And this code uh, has been deployed over um, Azure uh, web apps, okay? So my goal is try to change this message. So because there is a question um, stated by Mary Popendick a few years ago, years ago that say, how long does it take to your company to deploy a change that, that involves a single line of code? So that's what we are going to do now. Okay, so well, what we're going to do is modify the code, and by doing the, these changes, there will be a set of action trigger that, as a result, will deliver the expected change in the website. Okay, so let's go here, views, home. Okay, this is the about page. First of all, a disclaimer. Don't do this at home. What I'm going to do is change directly the source code and commit my changes over the master branch for the ones who know about JIT terminology. Uh, in the real world, what you must do is create a branch, do commit your changes over your branch, and later create a pull request in order to know it's okay to merge your changes over the master code. But in this case, for demo purposes, I'm writing directly to the source code. Okay. Okay. Let's go edit. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the text that must be changed. Okay, I perform the commit. I'm adding a comment over my changes. Okay. Perfect. So what we're going to do is to know what are the changes performed. So now I'm going to the build the pipelines, I'm going to check the builds. So first of all, we're going to review the build pipeline. So let's edit, we take care of this name, build core F EF01, edit. And now this, this is a, Build pipeline 
on Azure Pipelines. So a pipeline is a sequence of steps or tasks that are going to be performed in order to achieve a result. And in this case, the result is to have an artifact, uh, a, web, uh, a zip file for, for this demo that it will be later called an artifact that is going to be deployed in a further uh, step. So my, my the goal from here is to compile, test, and have our our zip file. So first, uh, in, we have we have to provide an instruction to use Nugget later to restore, perform the build, test and our solution, publish the symbol. Uh, and for me, I added an extra step uh, because I require to copy certain uh, PowerShell files that are not going to be included in the zip file. Publish the artifact, so after all the steps have complete, we require to take the zip file and put in a shared place for the further deployment step. And look at this. I have this extra step called S3 upload. This step is very interesting because it allows us to deploy or to copy the artifact over a Amazon S3 bucket. Just to mention, here we have the bucket in Amazon. I have a path. Um, look at this number. Okay, 233, and yes. Okay, so I mentioned the steps that are going to be performed over our source code, but who is doing uh, such steps? Yes, in the case of Azure DevOps, there is a concept called agents. And there are two kinds of potential engines. One agents, one of these kind of agents are the hosted. And what a hosted agent means, it means that every time that I'm going to do a build or deployment, as we'll see in a few minutes, we are asking to Azure DevOps, hey, Azure DevOps, I require a, an agent to do my build. Okay, now you have this virtual machine, uh, and with, in that virtual machine, you have a defined set of tools. Uh, you can have a Go, a Python, or so on, and there is a list of what tools are included in such agent. So after you use your agent, and a few minutes later of your last usage, such agent has been decommissioned, you lost access to it, and it returns to Azure DevOps to be assigned to another user. So you are not the owner of such agent. Okay, uh, so let's see what options we have. This hosted is the Google class Windows Define. We have this hosted Linux preview, and be careful about this because uh, Microsoft is about to retire this kind of agent. Oh, look, we have a uh, Mac OS agents, we have a hosted Ubuntu, and if you are going to perform uh, compilations over Linux, you are required to do this, to use this. We have a, another one using a, a hosted version of, of Visual Studio 2017 guess that the, that the next year we are going to see another host agent with the new version of Visual Studio. And now Microsoft is testing this new agent based on Windows containers. Okay, that are the set of hosted agents that Microsoft can provide you. They have a limited set of tools, uh, not, uh, but enough big for most of your requirements. But what happens if you have a lot of bills and you you don't want to wait in order to be assigned an agent? Plus, you require to install certain tool 
that is not being offered by Microsoft by default. In that case, we can use what is called a private agent. What I did is to set up a Windows Server virtual machine. I installed Visual Studio and other tools, and later I register such virtual machine as an agent. So this is my virtual uh, machine that's working as agent for this build. Look at this. This is my virtual machine, and I'm starting uh, Windows, and I define um, the size of my machine because uh, I decide, okay, I want all 8 gigs of RAM and so on. Okay, so th that's how it works. So let's see what happened while we were talking about. Let's go back to the builds. And yes, during our chat, this build has been run with my changes. Remember, I, I write down on webinar. So let's see. And this is the log. All the steps were performed, included this S3. Okay, it was uploaded to Amazon servers. So remember 2002. And let's check if the bucket has been updated. Yes, a new version has been uploaded uh, since then. Okay, let's go. So, as I mentioned, the first step was to create an artifact, a healthy artifact, but now we want to deploy. So, we have to check what is called a release pipeline. Okay, while we were talking, another sequence of events were triggered. So before visit what happened, we are going to know how a release pipeline is defined. So go to edit. And yes, this is how a release pipeline looks like. So the entry point for a release pipeline is an artifact. So in this case, the artifact came from our build pipeline. Remember, build core EF01. So every time that our build pipeline has complete properly, a trigger is launched and start the sequence of deployment over these stages. So yes, we have a stage for dev and we have a stage for QA. So let's see what has our dev stage. Okay, it's it has a simple task, and this is the deploy over an Azure App Service, and this is one of the oldest tasks that Microsoft created. Look, we have in version three. It allows to deploy easily to a web app here. So with this step, we are deploying to our app service. So we define which subscription we are using, what kind of service we are deploying to, because we are not restricted to deploy to web app. We can deploy to Azure Functions, by example. OK, look at this. And there is something interesting to care about. I have filled uh, the, um, the option to transfer the, a deployment file. Look, I set up in order that every time a deployment is performed, there will be a change over this file, app settings, JSON. Why? Because this file is, is supposed to store the connection string, but the connection string is a critical part of your project because it could have the credentials to connect to your production environment. So it's strongly, strongly recommended to not store sensitive data in your source code, but 
if we cannot put connection string in our data, how we can make our production runs? Well, what you have to do is put such sensitive data in another place, in a secure place. So, in this case, I'm using what is called Azure Key Vault. Azure Key Vault is a service that allows us to save sensitive information, save certificates, and in my case, what I'm saving is a secret. So I save a secret called SQL password, and later I'm integrated this keyboard in my Azure pipeline, allow, allowing us to mix everything, and this the result of this mix will be only on the target environment and won't be seen by the people that has access to Azure DevOps. The results only will be available in the target environment and allow us that all the developers have access to Azure DevOps but don't having access to the secrets, okay? Because you can define granular security over the different keys, secrets, or certificates managed by your Azure Key Vault. And how you can do that? Because I have a variable that is much is reading from a uh, key vault and later assign over this another variable that performs the transformation. So this is very powerful to store your sensitive information in a different place. Okay, let's go back to the pipeline. But okay, I I deploy my application and so on, but what happens next? I, uh, then I deploy to another environment directly? No, because we need to, we can, we could want to validate that our first deployment went fine. So I define it that every time that a deployment over our dev environment uh, has completed, it's required to perform an approval and I'm asked to approve this, okay? So, let's see, let's go to the web application, refresh, and check if my changes are there. Oh yes, the changes are here, perfect. So everything went fine. So I can explain the, the upcoming steps. So go back here. So now we can understand what this message means. It means, okay Ernesto, uh, the deployment to dev has complete and you are asked to approve. All right, I'm going to approve. Also, at the same time, I receive an email uh, uh, asking me to do the approval. Okay, so let's go to here. Okay, great, I approve. And now my dev stage has been approved. But now we are triggering the QA stage but it has a different set of rules. Why? Because, let's see, sometimes you, by business definition or technical definition, you are required to deploy only if certain condition has been complete. 
in this case, what I define is uh, you can only deploy to QA if uh, an Azure function has returned OK. So let's go to the pipeline definition to, to, to know a bit more about it. OK, let's edit the definition. Remember, this was a post deployment condition that required a, that a human approve. But now I'm putting a pre deployment condition. In this case, the deployment condition is something called gate. I created this gate called uh, that is based on an Azure function. But I could add another kind of gate. I could invoke a REST API from a third party uh, to monitor to query something in our Azure subscription. By example, I cannot deploy to this environment if the if such environment has a lot of workload. You have to wait until the workload decreases. Okay, so I can put my deploying in a hold for a while. Also, I can ask, okay, you cannot deploy if you have bugs pending to solve. Oh, okay, so you can query to it to uh, Azure boards, and also you can query against uh, and security assessment because Azure provides you a security assessment, uh, warning you if there is something wrong with your uh, Azure resources. So you can query. Okay, I have uh, a security issue. No, ah, deploy. Okay, I have a security issue. Oh, yes, you have. So we can put this in a hold. But these holds are not supposed to run forever. You have, you only can ask for it for a, di a limited set of time. Okay, so look at this. I can ask the action function every 15 minutes but I can only ask for my Azure function for three days. Sometimes you can define another set of, uh, of rules for your retries or for the time that you are, low, are allowed to do your retry. So this adds the custom way that you want. So look, in order to close this, you can have a human saying, okay, deployment has everything that I want, but also you can define technical conditions over your deployments, okay? So let's go back. QA stage, everything succeeds. Look at this, this is very important, that means that the gate has been run, so the action function was queried. So we can see the log. Okay. The response code was okay, and this is was my message. Go deploy a step. And this is where the steps, and be aware that in this case, we are not deploying over Azure. We, are, we were deploying to Elastic Beanstalk uh, from Amazon. So let's go here. Okay, look at this. This is running in Amazon. And yes, the message have been updated as well. I have, I want to mention something extra regarding this. We're going to see the logs for the another step. This, look at this line, say, JSON variable substitution apply successful. That line, that's the one that indicates that we change it. 
the original value in our app settings JSON and add the new one. Okay. So plus I'm going to show you something uh, very funny. In order to know what been playing. Look at this. This is a connection string. It's a uh, rubberish in Spanish, but if we're going to go in here. I'm going to do this very quickly in order to, okay. Look at this, the connection string was there. Okay, this is my friends how the combination has been performed. So that's the demo. So let's go back to the presentation. So when we have a different set of services that are part of Azure DevOps, Azure Board, Azure Report, Azure Pipeline, Azure Test Plan, Azure Artifacts. The idea is that yes, you can work it separately but they work better together. You can you can have end-to-end uh, -end traceability, uh, the capability to support any size of team. It's available to any region uh, in, in Azure. It has the customer support provided by Microsoft and is integrated with the administration access control defined by Azure and Azure Active Directory. But it's only a part. The Azure ecosystem is big, so alongside this service, you can work with a Azure Function, a APP Application Insights, a API Management, Security, integrate with Jenkins. Yes, you can use Jenkins as, a, as your build tool. You can integrate with con, third con party tools like Ansible, Chef, and so on. It's important for you to try to use the concepts of infrastructure of, uh, as code and configuration as code. And for that, Azure DevOps supports working alongside with Terraform, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, etc. stack. Why is important to have these tools in mind? Because now you are not only deploying your application in a target environment. Now, with this kind of tools, you can create your target environments at runtime. And how you can do that? With infrastructure as code, you define in code what are the settings for your target environment. It could be a virtual machine, a web app, a, a database, and or a different kind of service offered by Azure. And later you run your script and Voila, you have your target environment in a few minutes. Um, okay, the deployment didn't work. You destroy the environment and later you can recreate it. So that's why it's important to focus uh, infrastructure and configuration as code. It's important to have in mind application insights. It's a very, full, a very powerful tool based on Azure Monitor and Log Analytics that offers you a powerful set of queries, charts, and statistics about how your application is running. Also, and this is for me, one of the most important parts is that you can add uh, a few lines over your code, allowing you to create custom metrics. By example, you can add uh, conditions in your code that increase the metric every time that certain product category is being sold or every time that certain kind of 
employees have been low or or kind of or such kind of stuff. And yes, you can later see as a chart. So it's very powerful to try to learn application insights in order to know how your application has been used. Not only how performed, but how it has been used. So the main idea is, yes, you have uh, the service offered by Azure DevOps, but you can integrate it with a different set of tools. You can pick up to deploy to Kubernetes, to deploy to Amazon, to deploy to Docker, to, to deploy to uh, Apple tools, and so on. So the main idea is that the companies, the, the, the developers, mix the required tools to achieve the goals. So this is a, a very important number that we need to care about. Who is using uh, Azure DevOps? Microsoft is using Azure DevOps. Uh, pro, uh, the products as big as Windows or Microsoft Office has are being created using Azure DevOps. Uh, in the last two or three years, uh, Microsoft rolled out Azure DevOps as the tool for all the Microsoft works. So look at these numbers. So that shows you how eager is Azure DevOps to support great big workloads for different organizations. This is something funny uh, because a few months ago, I was able to see the big picture, and this is the pipeline for Azure DevOps. So uh, I was able to see the full pipeline. I have a lot of steps, a lot of stage, uh, what's amazing. But the key idea is Azure DevOps is built using Azure DevOps. So every change that you are seeing in the upcoming weeks or in your Azure DevOps organization has been created using Azure DevOps. Okay, uh, something interesting we need to know because I mentioned about a tool called Team Foundation Server. Uh, so Microsoft recommends you, if you are using previously a Team Foundation Server, you can migrate it to Azure DevOps and by doing that, you can have global availability. Your instance will be supported by Microsoft. You are not, you don't have to worry about the servers where your uh, code has been deployed. You'll have access to the latest features. Uh, what does it mean? Because every time that a new functionality has been added to the product, you have to wait for the update or you have to wait for the new version. By having uh, Azure DevOps, you now can uh, have the latest features every time that they're being deployed, and that allows you to deploy easily to Azure. Yes, it could be the case that you have a lot of work in your Team Foundation server servers, but there is a tool provided by Microsoft that makes it easy to the upgrade to Azure DevOps, and here in Bellatrix, we can help you with that process. And now let's start for the hard part of this. Uh, I'm going to start by the middle. If you are a regular a small team, you can start. You can have a teams up to five users, and you have a uh, free users. You have a uh, Unlimited, unlimited uh, JIT repos, and a um, back of 1,800 minutes per month by running your builds, okay? But what happens if you have a open source project? As I mentioned, we have unlimited users and unlimited uh, build time, and you can have 10 parallel jobs. What does it mean about parallel jobs? Uh, you'll see, uh, you have seen that I have running 
uh, first a build and later I have uh, a deployment pipeline running. Well, if my team, if my organization have a lot of team projects and a lot of uh, pipelines that are required to be running, they are by default enqueued because you only can have running one uh, job at a time. So for open source projects, you are not limited to that. You can have an, up to 10 parallel jobs. Okay, yes, but what happens if I have 20 users, uh, 50 users? Well, uh, starting with the six uh, user, every user uh, costs you $6. And yes, you have a back of 1,800 minutes per month and also uh, you can only have one parallel, uh, one job at a time, but you there is a price if you want to have parallel uh, jobs at a time. Okay, that's our, the idea when you are working with uh, Azure DevOps and you are having big teams. Okay, and finally, uh, I've listed, uh, Microsoft listed a uh, question regarding certification uh, first in BSTS and now in Azure DevOps. So Microsoft is about to release the final version of the 400 uh, exam that covers mostly Azure DevOps. And it's about to be launched a new certification focus on DevOps engineers. So if you want to certificate on the Azure DevOps but start looking for this exam that is about to be released live in the upcoming weeks. So thank you for my side. So Charles. Excellent. Thank you, Ernesto. It was an excellent presentation, very comprehensive. Um, at this point, I just want to make sure everyone is aware that if you do want to ask a question, then please do let us know. Um, and you can do so as mentioned either via the chat box on the bottom right hand side of your screen or via Twitter. And actually, Ernesto, whilst you were speaking, a couple of questions came in, so I think it's worth our jumping straight, straight, straight to them. Um, and the first question is, uh, what kind of support is provided for containers in Azure DevOps? Great. Uh, starting 2016, um, Microsoft added support first to Docker containers, so also, uh, it, it, it came alongside with the Linux support. So now you can deploy easily uh, your Docker image to um, Docker Hub and also to uh, Azure Container Registry. And there are steps in your pipelines that allow you to pull your image from your uh, registry over your target environments, being that your target environments could be an uh, Azure Container instance, could be uh, Azure Web Apps supporting containers, or also could be to Kubernetes. So there is a powerful set of tasks that enables you to create a complete solution using uh, Linux containers or Windows containers. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and also a second question which came in, um, and th that is, um, are you required to have uh, Azure to use this tool? Oh, yes and no. Yes, it's something funny about it, because uh, let's talk about the, the team with up to five users. You can create your Azure DevOps organization for your team, and you are not required to have any Azure subscription uh, for any reason. But what happens if we uh, want something extra? Something extra could be an additional user or you are running out of uh, build minutes. In that case, you need to pay, but that pay is uh, supposed to be perform but throw an Azure subscription. So in that cases, the, the, the teams 
need to set up an Azure subscription, link your Azure DevOps organization to such Azure subscription, and all your payments will come directly from your Azure subscription. But if you are not creating uh, any Azure resource, by example, so the idea will be that you define an Azure subscription with the with the option pay as you go, link to a credit card, and your consumption for your user or your extra minutes will be built through your Azure subscription as you go, but you are not required to uh, to create any extra Azure required resources, only the extra payments required for your Azure DevOps organization. Excellent, thank you. Um, and I see we just have one last question which has come in, which I'd like to take now. Uh, and th that is, what is the future of, um, of Team Foundation Server? Oh, yeah, Team Foundation Server, it's a product that started in 2005, as I mentioned, and uh, there are a few, a, a lot of organizations that are running on it. So as I mentioned, the main idea is try to move, uh, Microsoft encourage you to move to Azure DevOps, but if for security reasons or internal policies reasons, you still want to do, use the uh, Team Foundation Server, yes, Microsoft um, assures that such product will be supported and there will be new versions. Um, but there is something that you need to take care now about, because uh, the last version of Team Foundation Server was called Team, Fun Team Foundation Server 2018. But what was supposed to be Team Foundation Server uh, 2019, now it is about to be delivered as Azure DevOps Server 2019. At this moment, a release candidate has been delivered. So in the upcoming weeks, you'll see the final version of Azure DevOps Server 2019. And a new server, new versions, will be delivered as well. Microsoft won't stop its support for the on-premise uh, clients. Okay, excellent, thank you. And I, I see at this time we don't have any further questions, so I think this is a good time to, to bring the session to a close. Um, with that, I'd like to say a very big thank you to everyone on the line today for, for joining us. Also, a big thank you to you, Ernesto, for sharing your expertise. It's been incredibly insightful and, and interesting to hear uh, about Azure DevOps. Just a quick note to everyone on, on the line today that if you want to know more about it or if you have any further questions, anything that comes to mind, uh, you know, in reflecting about the information that Ernesto has shared with you, with you today, um, then please don't hesitate to, to get in contact with us. Uh, we would love to continue the conversation and see where Bilatrix uh, can help you and your organization. I should mention that a recording of today's session will be available within the next 24 hours on our website and also on our YouTube channel. Uh, and so any final thoughts you want to leave the audience with? No, thank you so much, Charles. Uh, I hope that this session uh, helps you to have interesting on review what Azure DevOps and especially Azure Pipelines can do for help you in your deployment process and to achieve what is expected from a DevOps approach in your companies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye.